Hi, Glennis. Hey, Aaron. What do you want to talk about today? How much I f- hate diets. <laughs> yeah, diets suck. <laughs> so what do you do instead of a diet? Intuitive eating. Health at every size. So how many times have you had to explain intuitive eating and health at every size to someone? Like 5,000 times. But and... that was just to my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so how many times have you explained it to someone and then they said, but diets are the only thing I know? That's like every time. Can we pursue health without thinking about weight? Yes, we can pursue health without thinking about weight. That's pretty revolutionary what you just said. But what if you just don't like yourself at the size that you're at? I think we need to understand why instead of just saying I need to change. So, what's the deal with body positivity? Oh man, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron Flores. And I'm Glennis Oyston. And we are Dietitians, Dietitians Unplugged. Unplugged. <laughs>Welcome back to another Dietitians Unplugged. We're back in the studio and we have such an exciting episode for you today. We're so excited that we have Kai Hibbert on from season three of The Biggest Loser. And she is a very outspoken body positive activist now, anti-diet, anti The Biggest Loser, everything. She's like on our side now. So we're so <laughs> excited to have her on the show today. Yeah. But yeah, but let's catch up, Aaron. How's it going in your life? It It's awesome. I think we got to say like, this is like our little, again, one of our, another one of our celebrity moments. Yeah. Because we've talked about Kai on our show before when we yes. talked about The Biggest Loser and to actually like have her on is really awesome. Um, no, things are good. I um, So one of the things that I just want to sort of plug out there is uh, I started this project where I want to have 100 conversations with men about their bodies, about body image. And it's a 30 minute conversation. It's whatever you want to talk about. I will listen and just ask questions. I have done eight or nine so far and they're awesome they are so much fun what a great thing because i feel like this is something that men are not encouraged to talk about and this is something that's seen as the realm of women that we should only talk you know women oh it's a woman thing to talk yeah. about your body but we know that 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 body image problems are bleeding over into you know the world of men it's yeah. like you know it used to just be something that was horrible for women and now it's yay yeah. so, <laughs> everybody gets to have it so what's really awesome is it um that comes up every time is they almost say like i've never really talked to anyone about this but they have in the any sort of real oh totally yeah oh to there are our feelings um there are some feelings and it's um it's been great because people have been so so honest and so vulnerable in what they're sharing to basically a complete stranger i don't know any of these people uh and so it's been super interesting and we'll see what comes of it but i would love to hear from more people so you can always email me at aaron flores rdn at gmail.com if you're interested and i will re respond to you and give you some information about how to sign up and um some answer any questions you have about the project cool yeah. And then, you know, other stuff is I'm still, my private practice is still yeah. going. If people are interested, you should definitely. Don't be modest. You just expanded your office. I just expanded my office. Yeah. <laughs> where uh, our, maybe our the next um, session when we record will be in a brand new swanky place. Yeah. If the acoustics are better. Sure. We'll see. <laughs> um, and It's uh, bigger, so maybe they won't be. Yeah. So I'm trying to create like a, a, a really like a health at every size uh, welcoming space in Southern California. I mean, I don't know of any other like full on practice that is health at every size focus that is really trying to welcome all different bodies and experiences into the fold. So, so that's new. Yeah. So it sounds like you're going to do some groups and some programs. Yeah. I'm looking and... forward to maybe starting a binge eating disorder group. Yeah. Uh, and Much go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. How about you? Um, so this past summer I opened my office, um, and I'm taking clients in person in the Brentwood area of Los Angeles. So I'm super excited about that. So anybody in Los Angeles, you'd like help with stopping feeling crazy around food. <laughs> I'm your person. And I still take people by, you know, uh, video conference as well. So to teach intuitive eating. So awesome. yeah. Yeah. So I'm really excited um, about getting more into the work that I love. Yeah. 
So Glennis and Aaron taking over the world. Yeah. One little step at a time. Right. World domination. Yeah. Health at every size. Health. World domination. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We need. I feel like we need one of those like. <laughs> world domination. Well, there we have it now. There it is. Because you just did it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So let's get to our podcast. We um we did this great interview with Kai, and I think you're all gonna love it as much as we loved recording it. So a little bit about Kai. She's a body acceptance activist who was first cast in the spotlight through her participation in and subsequent denunciation of the weight loss game show The Biggest Loser. Going through the program, she realized the negative impact the show had not only on her own life, but on society in general. Vowing to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem, Kai has fought against unrealistic and damaging messages in the media regarding our bodies. She's been featured in magazines and newscasts ranging from the Huffington Post, Time Magazine, Good Morning America, ABC News, CBS News, E!, The New York Times, and many, many more. So she's basically a celebrity guest. Totally. She's unapologetically honest, which is fantastic and something we really uh, appreciated in in the conversation. Just wanted to bring up a couple things. We're going to bleep out probably her uh, talks about how much weight she lost or or some triggering things like that. But if still you're feeling really vulnerable and triggered by a lot of weight loss talk, uh, you know, you might want to be think again about listening to this episode because she does talk about her experience on The Biggest Loser. Um, you could probably also just skip the first maybe 15, 20 minutes and maybe talk, you know, listen to the to the last part. But I just wanted to make sure right. that's out there in case people um, do, you know, are, are struggling in that area. Yeah, but we'll take the numbers out. So you don't hear them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's a really awesome interview and I think you all will really enjoy it. So welcome to our show today, Kai Hibbard. We are so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you for having me. So for our listeners who have never actually watched The Biggest Loser, and I have to admit, I was I'm one of them just because. Um, Yay! <laughs> right, because <laughs> even though I was heavily embroiled in diet culture at the time that it was on, something seemed very wrong about it to me. So I kind of made a, a point of never watching it. But uh, but tell us, but we all know about it. So tell us a little bit about how you decided to become a contestant on season three of the show, and then and then how that kind of played out, and where you placed at the end. Sure. Um, so first of all, for people who haven't watched the show, um, good job. Gold star from me. Um, uh, secondly, I ended up on the show because um, I did stupid things in my 20s. Lots of people do stupid things in their 20s. I just went big. Um, I had never <laughs> seen I'd never seen the show. Um, and I know when people are like, are you kidding me? You went on a reality TV show without ever watching it? I did. Yeah, I in fact was that poor at decision making in my 20s. Um, I uh, instead of doing keg stands, I decided to go on reality TV. I was living with a girlfriend at the time who was also very, very heavily into diet culture. She was a fitness competitor. Um, and she had seen the show, knew that they were asking for contestants. I had recently um, gained a lot of weight. And um, she was like, this would be perfect for you. In retrospect, that's super insulting shit. Um, but at the time, <laughs> I was like, yeah, this will be great. So I sent in um, their application off the internet and I sent in a videotape. And um, uh, at that time, as far as I know, I was the only person ever cast just off of a videotape because they hadn't come to Alaska where I was living at the time to do a casting call. (laughs) Big surprise. Nobody wanted to come to Alaska in the dead of winter to cast someone. Um, So I ended up on the show. I uh, basically lost my mind. It was like Alice through the looking glass. Um, I fell down a rabbit hole where I started to believe things like a cup of coffee was a meal. And, um, I lost, oh gosh, somewhere around, somewhere around pounds in the span of like eight months. Um, and just, if you were curious, that's, that's not healthy, either calling coffee a meal or losing weight that rapidly while calling coffee a meal. 
Um, and I ended up in second place. Uh, I lost out to a dude from New York who started out at over pounds. So in order to win, honestly, I would have had to cut off a limb and NBC probably would have supported that if they didn't think that their viewers would notice. So that's kind of how the experience wow. went for me. And yeah. can you, can you tell me, so they measured a person's success in how many actual pounds were lost? Um, it was, so I guess that was the original metric. Again, I didn't watch the show, but then they decided it was more fair. And I'm doing air quotes. If you could see me to do it as a percentage of body weight loss. Right. Um, okay. so he beat me by having a higher percentage of okay. body weight loss than I did. However, um, the doc associated with the show, um, told me that, I don't know if they've been measuring it on different metrics or whatever, I guess that I would have won because the issue again, air quotes is that I, I put on lean body mass yeah. at the same time that I lost all this weight because, um, by the end, um, I had started to lift weights and, um, started being a lot less cuckoo about everything because my, um, my family had actually intervened and staged an intervention, um, wow. in October. Yeah. In October before the finale, um, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, um, uh, took a look at me and he was like, um, yeah, you're going to die. So he got my parents on the phone. He got a couple of friends. They all sat me down and they were like, you might win this show, but, um, you're going to drop dead. And so it doesn't really do you any good. And they, they literally babysat me for the last like three months up until the finale to make sure I was eating. And, um, they, this is going to sound insane because it is, um, they cut back my workouts, um, from between six and eight hours a day, which is what I was doing down to three hours a day. And, um, I remember thinking that like, that was just complete laziness that working out three hours a day wasn't enough. I, I literally cried. God love the patience of people who love me. So yeah. Yeah. So, so I have, I have a couple questions, uh, just sure. sort of about the, the show and also your experience. One is, um, Season three was, I mean, what year are we talking? Like 2003? 2000, no, 2007. It's 2007. been a decade. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. been 10 years. So I think it's yeah. important for us, like, because we're, we are 10 years removed. And I think the, you know, season three, I rem I will admit, I did watch The Biggest Loser. Uh, and I watched it as I was becoming a dietitian because I wanted to see, oh, where's the dietitian? I wanted to like... <laughs> Seriously, I wanted to know, like, oh, is it – what are they saying? Are they giving good advice or bad? I, I was like – and then I – like all reality TV, I got sucked in, right, to the stories. <laughs> and and um, and so – but like season – you know, the first few seasons, it started – it wasn't quite the phenomenon. It became a little bit later, right? So when you say like it, I sort of – I applied – It took off. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it took off actually with my season. They did the 50 States stick yeah. and um, from there it exploded. Yep. But like it's important to like I could totally understand applying for a show that, <laughs> that you hadn't seen because it wasn't like quite the phenomenon yet. It wasn't like, oh my God, you – have you seen what's going on on this show? Um, so I, I, I really get that. But my question is as you sort of got in – and you started, you know, your time on the show. Um, was there any point in in that while you were sort of being filmed there where you realized, holy moly, this is nuts? <laughs> um, so uh, it, it was it, I like to think of myself as a person. I mean, we all like to think of ourselves in the most positive way possible. And I had totally thought that I was such an independent spirit that I could never, ever, ever be brainwashed. I was yeah. completely wrong. Yeah, I was totally wrong. Um, when I, I have to say, I can't speak for anybody else's experiences. I never speak for other people's experiences. I have no idea what happened on later seasons or earlier seasons, but I know that on my season, contestants were completely isolated from people that might have genuinely given a shit about their health, um, huh. mental and physical. I wasn't allowed to call home. <clears throat> and then when I was allowed to call home, they were in five minute increments and they had to be supervised by a production assistant. Um, my letters both out and coming in were open and redacted Wow! because yeah, they were afraid that we were going to give away show secrets, um, or that somebody from home would write something disturbing that they wanted to catch on camera for a good drama moment. Yeah. Um, there was a registered dietitian attached to the show. There was a side D attached to the show and there is an MD attached to the show. However, all of that said, they didn't live on that ranch with me. They, um, 
the registered dietitian came, I believe, twice to speak with us. And the entire time that she tried to speak with us or talk to us about how we should be eating or what we should be doing, she would be interrupted by production who would um, turn to the contestants and say, you need to remember that your trainer is your final word on what you eat. Wow. And um, other things like, um, you know, that might be very good advice, but you have to remember that if you eat that way and you gain weight, you're going to get sent home. And, and at the same time, you're being told the whole time you're there that, like, this is saving your life. Like, I didn't, I didn't go on that show thinking I was about to die at any moment. But I tell you what, by the time they got me about a month in, I was like, my fat is going to kill me. Yeah. And it wasn't going to kill me. There was, it, I was an aerobics instructor at the time. I just happened to be a fat aerobics instructor with pretty crappy choices in food. And if I had, you know, been taught make better choices, not insane ones, like calling coffee a meal, I would have been way better off than what I ended up doing to my body on there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so yeah. interesting. So I think what's really important for, for us to sort of understand is, and for all the people listening is how did this transformation occur for you? Right. You had the intervention, your family sort of babysat you. You came in second. Um, what what happened next in, in sort of this journey for you? Um, I well, you know, recovery is a cycle and it involves relapse. And so um, even after my family intervened um, and they got me to a registered dietitian, they got me to a, a mental health professional, actually a social worker, and they got me to a doctor. And so working with them, um, I managed to get a little bit out of my crazy place. Um, I started eating again, um, cause I wasn't eating. I was working out for six to eight hours a day and, and basically drinking coffee. Um, I, I started to eat again. And then after the show, after the hoopla, after the finale, after it was all over, um, I continued to work with them and I relapsed again when I, um, when I got pregnant with my son, actually, uh, I, as much as I was recovering and doing well, I had still been conditioned to believe that, um, like white bread was the devil basically. <laughs> and, um, any simple carb like that was, it was the devil and I needed to avoid it. And, um, that's all I could keep down when I got pregnant. I was so, so sick. And so then I'm eating this and I've got these weird guilt feelings surrounded, you know, surrounding what I'm eating and then I'm gaining weight again. And, you know, instead of being rational and thinking about the fact that like, I'm, I'm growing a human being, like I'm hungry because I'm making an eyeball, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> it, two eyeballs, I hope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Like I, instead of comprehending that, um, I, I was just completely focused on the fact that I was gaining weight. And unfortunately I had a very complicated pregnancy with my son and, um, I bled through the whole pregnancy. And, um, so I was told I needed to be on bed rest and I needed to relax. And, um, I was still so messed up in the head that, um, I can remember when his father left for work one day, um, I waited until he was gone and I got up and I went for a run. Mm. Uh, I'm going to cry talking about this. Sorry. But, um, so I went for a run and I ended up, um, bleeding really, really badly. I thought that I'd lost him and we ended up in the hospital mm. and I didn't. And, um, so my husband sat me down and he's like, I love you, but your craziness almost killed this child that we have been desperate for. What are you doing? And so that was another, uh, it was a really big moment in recovery for me. And, um, it was scary. It was scary to see how, how brainwashed I've become that I was so afraid of being fat that I would risk my child's life. I, I, yeah, that was a moment. Wow. I'm, I mean, that's, thank you for sharing that too. Um, you know, it's, it's, as we're listening here to all those sort of behaviors you're describing and, and you kind of feel like you were brainwashed, but what you're describing is to us, what sounds like an eating disorder, essentially. I, I it's absolutely I so I hesitate to call it an eating disorder because when I have in the past, um, like for a piece I wrote for X, uh, Exo Jane, um, I was corrected by a professional who was like, look, you know, the DSM is what tells you if you have an eating disorder or not what you are describing because you haven't been assessed and you haven't been diagnosed is disordered eating. So that's usually how I frame it to everybody else because I've never been formally diagnosed. Right. And it's sort of a fine line. Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, 
but but all those if i was hearing a client talking about all those behaviors it would signal to me an eating disorder and and it sounds like you learned all that behavior on the show and they encouraged um, it absolutely i um i would say that um so I want to say that I learned all that behavior on the show. I learned, I learned, I can tell you what, I learned how to dehydrate on that show. I'd never knew how to do that before to manipulate a scale. I learned, um, that coffee, um, at least I was told that coffee would kill my appetite. I wasn't a coffee drinker before that show. Um, I learned what foods were diuretics on that show, but I don't want to say that I learned all of that mentality or that behavior just on the show, because I want to reference back to the fact that like, I learned diet culture from the fact that I was put into Weight Watchers in the third grade. Yeah. And we live in diet culture constantly. I exactly. Yeah. That was my first introduction to it, being a third grader who her mother decided to take her. And my mother, my mother was anorexic and my mother was diagnosed. And my mom decided to take me to a Weight Watchers meeting. And I think that, um, you know, from that point on, I was primed to to be receptive to any of these behaviors that, you know, thin is, is, it doesn't matter how, how much you're destroying yourself on the inside, but boy, you look great. And that, that was kind of the mentality that was hammered home during the show. As long as I look good, whether I was, you know, practically dying or not, that's all that really mattered is that I looked great when they put me up on that scale with a spray tan and a pair of heels. Right. And diet culture is the reason why a show like The Biggest Loser could go, you know, be created and become successful. And yes. sort of n n r rarely having been criticized over the years until the maybe yeah. last year, really. Um, Finally, and, I've been the lone voice for literally a decade. You right. have no idea how happy I was when other people were finally like, yeah, this has come terrible. And, you know, there are other contestants that, again, I don't ever speak for anybody else, but I've had lots of contestants behind the scene that have messaged me and been like, right on. Thank you for saying this. But then I also get other contestants that are like, you need to shut up because you're hurting my bottom line. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. And then you've got the other contestants that are like just believers, just full on believers. And well, I mean, that's obvious. JD Roth, one of the producers of the show, at least when I participated, has a new show out. Yeah. And it's got former contestants who yeah. agreed to go through the same kind of thing all over again. Yeah. Right. So I, I yeah. want to sort of, uh, acknowledge, you know, the fact that you were alone for so long speaking out against this show. And, um, you know, when for Glennis and I, we talk about sort of being, you know, there are not many dietitians who are sort of speaking out against diet culture. Right. So like, <laughs> I imagine not, you no. know, and, um, and so it's like you, you sort of find this small group of support, right. To get you through like being a rebel, uh, and, and going against the tide. But I think, um, it, it sounds like you were really alone for a lot of years in this fight. And so, you know, I think we need to just acknowledge how hard that must've been. And thank you for like continuing to do it because I can only imagine how hard it must've been to stand up against so many voices saying, no, no, there's nothing wrong with this. <laughs> it was, it was rough. I mean, like beyond even the, the voices coming back and saying that, like, you know, oh, it's fantastic. It's great. It was, um, you know, the, the legal threats from NBC and from the show threatening to sue me for money um, that I didn't have. I was like, right. hey, welcome to my student loan debt. Enjoy that. <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, that was kind of scary for my family. And um, the amount of anger. I mean, women, it's a totally different subject, but women get so much anger on the internet as it is, especially on social media. And then when you're going against the grain of something as strong as, um, you know, fat phobia in our society, woo, with the level of hatred. Wow. It was, I'm glad, I'm glad that I am the person that I am and that, um, that I have been my whole life in the sense that, um, I, this is going to sound like a weird thing to say, but I think being a fat kid kind of galvanized me against some of it. I, you know, I was be able to withstand the bullying because, you know, been there, done that and knew it didn't define who I was. And all I could do is what I could sleep with at night. And, and the reason I came forward about it all is um, I started speaking to people who were fans of the show 
And, you know, when you talk to a teenage girl that tells you that they watch a TV show and she starts crying because she couldn't lose the amount of weight that you lost on TV in a week and tells you that she'd started throwing up her food. Um, I don't know what kind of human being you are if you don't take responsibility for your part in that, especially when you know a week shown on TV was definitely not a week in real life. And, and there's this woman, this girl looking to you and looking at a product that you participated in and harming herself because of it. I, I personally, I couldn't sleep at night without saying something about it. That's just me. That's amazing. Good for you. Yeah. For having that clarity and the, and bravery <laughs> to sort of come out <laughs> against like basically TV networks and legal agreements to sort of, you know, did they ever carry out their, their threat to sue? I, you know, they didn't ever, and I'm not like, obviously I'm not an attorney. Um, I don't, I don't know if they would have won. I took, um, they kept trying to sue me, uh, trying to sue me based on my non-disclosure agreement. And I took the non-disclosure agreement to an attorney once and he looked at it and he laughed and he was like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. And he said, the problem is, is they have over a hundred attorneys and you can't afford me. So like they just bury you in, in paperwork, like, yeah. but they, yeah, he's like, but they never took it anywhere. Um, I, I know that a couple of contestants had been talking or there was talk after the NIH study came out about the damage that the show practices did to metabolism of getting a class action suit together. But to be quite honest, my goal was to get the show off the air. It's off the air. I kind of like, you know, check mark onto the next thing in my life. Yeah, I um, Yeah, I have. I have so many other things. Like, I mean, since I've been on that show, like I joined the army national guard. I was in the army national guard. I've got my son. Um, I'm about to graduate with my master's degree. I have so many other things to do that. I don't really want to get caught up in that all over again now that the show's gone. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, you mentioned this sort of girl talking to you about, you know, her, oh, yeah. her developing her own eating disorder uh, <sighs> because of watching the show um, was, was that like that moment that sort of caused you to change um, and sort of start speaking out or, or how many moments of the were there like that where you finally were like, I got to do something. And how did you start that? How did you start speaking out against the show? So my um, I started to gain clarity after the inter intervention and then after the um, the finale. I got incredibly, incredibly ill after the finale, even with, you know, people intervening and trying to get proper help. I dehydrated off pounds in the last two weeks before the finale. Um, and I, my immune system crashed, just crashed. And I ended up so sick when I got home. And, and at that point I was like, all of this is crap, all of this. And, um, I, I think I gave my first, I gave my first interview, the following August, I was contacted by Time Magazine, and I just laid it all out there, and um, everything that was unhealthy about it, everything that we were taught, and they and they they published the piece, and that's when I first got contacted, and NBC was like, "You're not to give any interviews without going through our publicist," and I was like, "Meh, I think I'll do what I want." <laughs> so, um, I started uh, at speaking engagements. It was kind of a bummer only in the sense that people would contract me to come and speak and talk about the show. And I'd try to give them a heads up about what I was about. And oftentimes I'd end up standing in the middle of a room of like all these rabid fans and they'd react like I killed Santa Claus when I told them the truth of what happened on that show. So, um, basically from the first moment that I had a, I had a voice or somebody contacted me, I, um, I spoke out about it. And then social media actually just made that, you know, exponentially easier. I, I had a platform, obviously not equal to the hundred billion dollar, you know, mega machine that is NBC, but, um, you know, there were people listening. Wow. That's great. Um, so you mentioned the study, uh, that they did, it was last year, I think, or that the, the results came out last year about yep. sort of what happened to the metabolisms of the participants in the show. And it seemed like everybody they followed from that season, like obviously lost weight on the show and then regained it six years later. And I'm just wondering if sort of that was your also your experience, if you had sort of a similar experience of that, that loss and regain after the show. Um Yes and no. It's funny. I never, um, I've never returned to my starting weight ever. That's 
and, and it's so funny because, you know, people who want to um, argue with me or come at me usually have one or two. They've decided my position stems from one or two places. One place without even seeing me, they've decided that I have regained all of the weight that I had plus some and I'm bitter about it. The other position is that I haven't regained any weight, but I'm just an ungrateful bitch. So um, I always tell people, like, you know, when they look at me, they put their own biases on me. And if they decide I'm fat, they decide that my narrative is one way. If they decide I'm thin, they decide my narrative is another way. So I just discount all of it, and I know what my own narrative is. Um, as far as weight goes, um, I gained, like, I don't know, I think, like, six pounds with my kiddo. And then um, that came off over time. Um and my weight still fluctuates up and down, but I've never, um, I've never returned to my starting weight. Right. And you had sort of mentioned earlier that, that you had gained weight through your twenties and, and it was maybe you weren't eating as well as you could have been. So it's entirely possible, you know, <laughs> your, your, your weight does what it does. That's, our, we, you exactly. know, exactly. Yes. But, but, um, it, it was just really interesting to see the results last year that sort of everybody regained some, all, or even more weight. And that's sort of very consistent with, I'm sure you know all the studies out there. In, well, I'm an outlier. Yeah. Like, I know that I'm right. an outlier. And right. It, yeah. And I try to express that to people. And I'm like, I am an outlier. And, and probably the reason I'm an outlier, you've touched on it. Um, my happy weight, and I don't give a flying fuck about BMI. I don't care about any of that, but my, my happy weight fluctuates honestly now because I've yo-yo dieted so much, um, anywhere between like, and I maintained that pretty much, um, all through college, all through everything. But my last year of college, I was working three jobs, including teaching aerobics and I was double majoring. So I was taking about 21 credits a semester and I wouldn't eat all day long. And I would be teaching aerobics classes and I'd be running from place to place. And then I would get home. I would eat whatever was available in my fridge. And then I would pass out in my face. Like, obviously, my weight was going to fluctuate when my habits were that way. Right. And I had, I had assumed that once I was back to a normal schedule that my weight would settle back down to my happy weight that I liked. I never even really considered it. And, um, and then I said, like, my, my friend was like, you should try this show instead. <laughs> and there I was. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> right. And so, and in the end, it's, you know, your it sounds like your weight is just as, I'm assuming you've sort of normalized eating habits over the years and, you know, it, it just sort of goes to the place, like you said, your happy weight where your body is most comfortable. So. That, that's the weight where I'm not killing myself to, um, to work out. Like I'm working out because it's fun and I like it. I'm not punishing my body. It's the weight where I'm not um, restricting every single thing that I eat. And it's the weight where I'm not binging because I've been restricting everything that I ate before that. Yeah. So that's why it's my happy weight. I had a little, um, I'm going to call it a blip this past year where I was really, really, really worried about, um, relapse because, um, I've got, uh, inflammatory arthritis and it took forever to be diagnosed because doctors kept trying to diagnose me fat that was, that was their right. solution. You're yeah. fat. And I'm like, that's no. Okay. When I finally got a doctor that um, listened to me and didn't diagnose me fat, we found out that I have infl inflammatory arthritis. So um, I'm on injections for it. But in addition, she recommended because of studies from the NIH that I try um, a vegetarian or vegan diet to combat inflammation. And I freaked I freaked because I was like, I can't, you can't, nothing restriction, no. Yeah. Um, and then I calmed down <laughs> a lot and I agreed to try it um, for six months until we did labs again. And if there was no difference in my markers and there made no difference on my inflammation, then I was going to the nearest Taco Bell and ordering a taco because I love <laughs> that. I don't even know if that's real meat. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, but it was a really scary thing for me. And, um, so as of right now, I'm, um, I'm, I guess my, my son corrects me. He's so cute. He's autistic. So he's very precise in everything. And he's like, uh, technically mommy, you're a pescatarian. I'm like, thanks kid. You're right. Yes. Yeah. That's what I am. <laughs> Get it right, mom. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Be precise. So that's, um, you know, in my work as a dietitian, it's, it's, I work a lot with folks in, in recovery from eating disorders or helping them move to recovery. And that, that instant where they sort of think about either because someone has told them or advised them or whatever, but that vegetarian diet, 
um, question comes up a lot. Like, yeah. like, how do I do this? How do I, you know, what if it is my ethic, right? What if it is a medical issue that it might benefit from? How do I sort of navigate it with the understanding of I'm, I'm also in recovery and, and yes. I don't want to jeopardize that recovery. Did your, when your doctor told you all this, did they, did, did they know your history with, with dieting? <laughs> She, she is aware of my history with dieting. Um, however, that said, I still, every single visit I go with her, um, and it's funny cause the nurse picks up on it and she's amazing. Um, I, they like to take the metric of weight. That's fine. Whatever. If you need it, but I get on the scale backwards yeah. cause I don't weigh myself. I don't want to know. And every time I go in there, this doc has to tell me if I'm looking thin or don't you want to know what you weigh? And I have to correct her every single time. Yeah. So when she presented me with the vegetarian thing, I went and spoke with my psychiatrist instead who had a better understanding of where I was coming from and what I was grappling with. Yeah. With it. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I'm picking up right there that I think is important that we touch on is the other part that I often comes up in recovery is how to advocate for yourself. Right. And like, and educate yes. people about this is, this is what I've been dealing with. And when you say this, or you ask me to do this, or um, it, or you diagnose me just as being fat, it, this is like, these are the triggers. These are the things that sort of send me reeling. And it's about, um, I would probably guess there's more disordered eating than what we see, right? Oh, yeah. And and how we talk to people about food and bodies needs to change. And so you being able to advocate for yourself is something that I often uh, encourage for other people in recovery as well is like, how do you learn to have a voice in a, in a culture that has told you to shut up and follow the meal plan, right. And go do this. How, how do you have a voice? Um, it's exhausting. Uh, I, I have a voice because I don't really have any other choice, I think is, is the best way I can put it. I mean, you know, the fact that I'm, I'm fat and so then my, my voice about my own body gets discounted is uh, it's compounded by the fact that I have a vagina. I mean, like, let's be honest, the yes. data shows that, you know, doctors don't listen to us. They don't listen to women and they sure as hell don't listen to fat women. And, um, so <laughs> it's going to sound like terrible advice. This is terrible advice, but I stay fucking angry. I stay angry. That's how I advocate for myself. Um, when I originally, it took two years to get my diagnosis of my inflammatory arthritis. And I can remember the very first, um, rheumatologist I was sent to, I was referred to by my primary care manager. Um, so I'm sitting in the office and I'm waiting and she walks in and the first thing she says to me is, well, are you managing your diabetes? I, I don't have fucking diabetes. <laughs> You're like, is that your way of diagnosing me? Is this like, are you right? dropping some new information here? Yeah, or? I was like, uh. And I, and, and I know my labs. So I knew my blood sugars were literally fucking perfect. And I just looked at her and I was like, um, I don't have diabetes. Are you in the wrong room? <laughs> and she kind of just like, you know, she, oh, she was taken aback and she was like, oh, well, I just thought, and I was like, that's not why I'm here. Wow. These are wow. my symptoms. And this is why I'm here. You might want to look at my file. And, and she proceeded from there with like, cause part of um, my symptoms at the time was rapid weight gain. Um, and, and I know why it happened now and what it was, but she just kept insisting that my joint pain was because I was fat. And I'm like, you need to fucking listen to me, lady. I'm telling you the joint pain came before all the weight. You're not listening to me. It sounds like and, you, you almost need to say like, uh, how are you managing your biases? <laughs> you know, I, like, right? Exactly. Yeah. And she, um, uh, I, I fired her basically. Cause you know, you've got the power to do that. And I, and I fired her ass because she wouldn't listen. And she kept insisting that I needed to just go on the Mediterranean diet, which is cool because I didn't see a registered dietitian um, qualifications anywhere in the fucking room. But whatever. Maybe she got a Google degree. Um, <laughs> so uh, I uh, I fired her. And then I actually filed a complaint with the hospital um, because she put my, my health at risk. My inflammatory arthritis, when I have my RA, it can damage my internal organs. And the longer I waited to find a diagnosis, the more my body was being damaged because I had to deal with this silly bitch <laughs> and fight with her. It was costing me time and costing my health. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I think that anger, I mean, is actually very healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, we, um, 
I remember talking to some some of my mentors and they said, you know, we sort of run at a slow at a low simmer all the time. <laughs> there we you go. You know, like and that's what helps us navigate this world. Yeah. I, I prefer anger to sad. Right. <laughs> Is yes. When dealing with this stuff. For mobilizing, right? Yeah, Mobi- yeah. exactly. I was going to say, to mobilize you because I'm yeah. immobilized when I'm sad. But when I'm angry, boy, I tell you what, I can write some letters. It's funny. Yeah. My my husband says that sometimes people people gauge me correctly when I make a, a complaint or I'm, I'm discussing something. They're like, ooh, that's one of those bitches that will write letters to everybody. And they're right. I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's it's like that song, that PIL song, the line is anger is an energy. And I'm like, yes, yes, anger is yes. an energy. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I'm just like, I'm like, you underestimate how much spare time I have. I can write every friggin' executive in this hospital. I can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and it's effective. Putting pen to paper, I think, is is the number one. And actually mailing something is is one of the most effective ways to make people sit up and listen. We, I work in a hospital. Aaron's worked in a hospital. We know when a, when a patient writes a letter, that shit gets some action. Yes. If for some reason, it's taken so much more seriously. Um, so write letters. That's, that's my advice to the world. Like, if there's something that's not working for you and you're not being listened to, write a letter. It Just, worked for me. She doesn't work at that hospital anymore. Yeah. That way. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so the biggest loser is canceled, as far as we know. As far as um, I know, woohoo! Although it seems like JD Roth is coming out with another show. Oh, he already has. Yeah, it's already premiered on okay. whatever network. Or it's already know. happened. So that's how. Like, I yeah. don't even have like cable. So that's how out of the loop I am. But I was kind of following it recently. I was like, oh, he's got another show. How's this not the same show? But it's anyway. My question is, what what's sort of your advice to TV networks out there that are plotting their their next exploitative show about fat people oh is go fuck yourself advice <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's yeah that that'd be my advice i i'm just i don't know it, maybe it's a, a culture-wide thing but i'm so fucking tired of of profits meaning more than people's lives like i'm really really over it um when um, the one contestant i don't know i think it was like two years ago um there was all this hoopla because her, she was deemed to be underweight yeah. at her finale. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And somebody asked me what my advice for her, for her was, if I was going to talk to her and I, and my entire advice would be get everybody who's making money off of you, the fuck away from you yeah. and start talking to people who aren't making any money off you. And, and that's the best way to get your head straight. I think that, Oh gosh, my advice for networks that want to keep doing this, just don't. Just don't, don't. And right. and I wish that, you know, I wish there was more weight behind it. Oh, that's a nice little pun. Yeah. <laughs> I wish there was more I wish there was more weight behind it. And you know, if a class action suit were possible and you could hit them in the in the pocketbook, I think people would listen more at these networks. I mean, you know, if a bunch of contestants were able to go, hey guys, you were told by a because this is true, you know, medical advice all the way up until the show says, do not diet this way, do not have people diet this way. And you had your entire show do these things, and now their metabolisms have shown that they've got permanent damage to them. I, I would like if they were financially liable for that. I mean, not personally for me necessarily, but just in general, so that they would stop friggin' doing it because yeah. that's where it's going to hurt them yeah. money. Yeah. And especially that it's like medically supervised. You know, that, that's the thing that, I, oh, that uh-huh. just bothers me so much. Um, it, it should bother you. You know, reading the, I, uh, reading his yeah. comments, like in the New York Times article, like when he's oh. like, well, maybe they just like need to work a little bit harder now. It's like, dude, are you serious? Yeah. Did uh, we like, fucking further, just say that? The pissing oh, blood wasn't enough. I yeah. Mean. <laughs> yeah, right. Like you need to work harder, piss more blood. You lose water weight that oh, way. So right. upsetting. <laughs> and and uh, my, my big beef, of course, is that that study came out and people were like, well, of course, you know, that's just extreme dieting. They shouldn't be doing that. But no. what, when you start looking at the, the evidence, it's like, well, even so-called safe dieting isn't really effective. And all that good for us long term so it's sort of like don't come out with another show with like a you know a a light version lifestyle (laughs) of the lifestyle (laughs) lifestyle biggest Uh, loser yeah Yeah, right well definitely starving yourself is a lifestyle (laughs) you know (laughs) It, it drives me insane the data does not support dieting and people do not want to hear that they just don't want to hear that right at all and they don't want to lose the fantasy of being thin no i you know so they're um there are a couple people that I've encountered and it, it, this was another kind of aha moment for me. Um, people 
especially who have lost a lot of weight and they've done so very recently are very rabid about defending it. Um, and the, the light bulb moment for me about it is, um, not only people who have, who have invested all this time and, and this energy into losing weight, get rabid about it. People who are genetically thin are invested in it too, because you know, it's awesome to be considered superior when you didn't have to do shit except walk around. Um, but I find that when people get angry at you for, for talking about, you know, um, body acceptance or about how dieting doesn't work, what they're really saying is, is when you tell me this, what you're telling me is that giving up all that food that I wanted to eat and giving up all that time I could have been spending doing things that I loved or with my family to achieve this aesthetic you're looking at right now wasn't worth it. And that's a scary thing to reconcile with. Oh, yeah. And I think Aaron and I both ran into that early on in our careers where, you know, I like you, I was an outlier. I was one of those people who had lost weight and actually kept it off for a long time. But, you know, with I was able to do that because I basically developed extreme disordered eating habits, yes. you know. Yes. And and when I first heard this information that for most people dieting doesn't work, it most people gain their weight. I was like really invested in hanging in there on, you know, like come on, this is bullshit. It's it, dieting totally works. It's worked for me until like, you know, kind of really took a hard light look at how unhappy I was in my mm -hmm. life. And yeah. uh that's the other thing I think people don't want to have a light sort of um shone on them and um or is it shined on them anyway <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I just ran into my grammar um grammar obstacle <laughs> but they don't sort of want to have that um ha uh, have to look at their lives and say like this is working for me but what's the definition of working like am i going insane am i happy and so people are like you said they're so invested in hanging on to this idea that permanent long-term weight loss is is possible from, you know, more than just a tiny fraction of people. And that's so, yeah. so hard. For, you know, that's the culture we're fighting against. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I totally agree. And, and to be honest, like I was, you know, I did not get exposed that like diets didn't work until I was a dietitian. Like, mm -hmm. and maybe cause I'm a guy, I didn't get a lot of, you know, diet messages as much. Right. But yeah. like, I just, um, when I was dieting and totally active, I just figured people weren't working hard enough. Like I really didn't understand all of that until, until I became a dietitian and started getting exposed to some, some, uh, other, you know, or actually I'll just say get, getting exposed to the truth. And, yeah. and it wasn't, yeah, it took me, it took me a while, a little bit longer to, to get there. I, um, you know, especially it's, it's on the rise in men right now because, yeah. you know, if it's marketable and people can make money off telling you how you suck, they're going to because then you'll buy their shit that'll supposedly make you not suck. Um, I, I find that I also had to like, as part of recovery, I had to end some friendships Yeah. Uh, because of people being so invested in, in this idea. And don't get me wrong. Like as far as on a personal level, um, I, there's no judgment about weight loss or weight gain as far as I'm coming from. I can understand. I know that there's this militant aspect to body acceptance and people feel like that, you know, if they want to lose weight to feel better about themselves, that they're not allowed in, in these body acceptance groups or these, you know, cliques or whatever. And I can understand people who want to lose weight. Like it's, it's kind of awesome to fit in an airplane seat when the rest of society tells you that you fucking suck when you don't like all of the societal pressure. I'm not going to judge you if you decide you want to make that choice. However, I think it's important to understand that if society weren't fucking telling you in about a billion little ways all the time and some big ways about how you're not worthy as you are, maybe you wouldn't want to lose weight. Like, I think that's kind of an important thing that um, gets kind of lost. I don't know. Nuance right. gets lost. Yeah. In, and in, yeah, it, you're right. And and I never judge anybody for that desire to want to lose weight because that's that's the culture we live in that tells us we yes. must do that for acceptance. Yep. But I do ask people, can you just question 
you know, yes, everything exactly. behind that. Like, can we yeah. look at Question patriarchy? You- can we look at fat mm-hmm. phobia? Can we look at just all of the things that have told us that fat is wrong? And why, when when we can look at studies that say, like, no, there are healthy fat people and there are unhealthy thin people, you know, that yes, that the bullshit we've been fed is is just that it's not actually uh, true necessarily that fat equals unhealthy um, or yeah. fat equals unattractive. You know, these are these are just arbitrary sort of ideas that people have put in place. So I just ask people, just question it, you know, just yep. sort of look at is it really fair that you're shamed? Uh, because you can't fit into an airline seat or could the airline actually make a few bigger seats? Right. right. Thank you. Exactly. And and I think that sometimes, you know, depending on the person, you either want to change society or you change yourself. And, you know, I've got moments in my life where I just conformed because it was easier. So I can't judge somebody for doing that. But, you know, I also love people who are like, no, nah, fuck this. I'm going to change society. I'm going to change society instead. And we're all on our own journey. And I just, I don't know. I feel like it's been, especially in social media, it gets really, really polarized. And yeah, it's, it's hard to have nuanced conversations about it, about with like self-determination and bodily autonomy while also acknowledging societal things that influence it. Like kind of a weird side note, but relates, I guess a little bit. I had a, um, an interaction on social media this morning about how capitalism influences everything and the patriarchy and fat phobia. And, um, my, my little example I gave was shaving my armpits, which has got nothing to do with being fat, but it is something that women do on the regular because in 1910, the Gillette company decided that they weren't selling enough razors and their entire marketing campaign was to tell women that they were gross if they had armpit hair. Like that's literally why we all shave our armpits now. Yeah. And yeah. And so we were having uh, this discussion about whether, you know, shaving or not shaving can both be empowering. And, and I personally, I shave my armpits because I feel like a rock star when I do, I don't really much with my legs cause I'm lazy and it requires bending and fuck that shit. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like you could be equally empowered by shaving your armpits as opposed to growing out your armpit hair and you can say fuck the patriarchy with both of them as long as you're aware of where your decision came from. I know where it came from. I know where this this trend started from. I accept that. I still feel better when I do it. So I do it. And, right. I, and I hope that we can find like that kind of nuance in the whole movement with, with body acceptance before we reach where I hope we get, where it's total fucking, you know, obliteration of fat phobia. Yeah. 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 I think that's such a great point because Glennis and I talk about this offline a lot is it's very hard on social media to have that nuance. And I think there is nuance. And I think one of the things that why Glennis and I uh, work so well together, both on this podcast, but also just outside is like, we are able to see nuance within so many different things. Like it's not just a black or white, issue and it's very hard to find that nuance on social media it's just like oh yeah i mean it's like uh, it degenerates into like you know uh name calling and like uh, (laughs) you know all all this crazy stuff like very quickly it's just like it's so it's very hard and that's why i think um conversations like these are really important for people because i think they they highlight the nuance and it gives people time to like really dive in and look at all a bunch of different sides of something yeah, all the factors that play into why we feel the way we do about our bodies. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so one last question before we wrap up is, sure. um, you, you know, you, you're definitely like continue to be a voice in this movement. Um, what if you were to sort of give advice to someone who's just getting their toes wet? Um, what would you tell them? Like, where would you have them start? Like, educating themselves. Um, what are some really good resources that you use? What's what's your support system in this um, fat phobic society? Like to stay to stay grounded in it. Um, I some of my my personal re- well my personal thing is um, I'm kind of a, a research rat, so um, I read, I read, 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 and I find that helps me. I would absolutely recommend Harriet Brown's um, Body of Truth. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, I, right? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, uh, I'm speaking at a conference that she's going to be at this fall and I'm insane. I'm not even going to be able to speak in front of her. I'm going to just stutter and <laughs> I can, I'm predicting it. Um, I would search out, see, this is, this is a difficult one for me to say too, cause I want to say I'd search out like, um, people who are already working towards this in a voice, but here's, here's my problem with some social media. Like we were just talking about nuance. Um, there are some organizations or some online periodicals that are using body acceptance as a marketing hook. And when you get into reading the actual pieces that they publish, they're kind of the antithesis of, uh, of body acceptance. Um, I don't want to call anybody out, but there are some periodicals that built their platform on this whole concept and then do things like publish articles about, um, about the latest diet and yeah. about how the person on it, how much weight they've lost yeah. and before and after photos. Yeah. And I know and, exactly who you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. All right. And that stuff is just, it's infuriating and it's garbage. Um, and, and it's hard to avoid when you're looking for body positive communities, when you find somebody that uses it as a marketing hook, the, the best I could say is, um, you know, look for the voices that are unfucking apologetic about their bodies. Whatever their body fucking looks like, look for the voices that are fucking unapologetic about being who they are and what they look like. Those are the people that I would look for. And those are the people that give me strength. Um, those are the people that I really admire. Like, my God, Lindy West, that's another person. That's another person. And, um, and her sister-in-law, whose name I'm going to butcher, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, but I'm going to try my best anyway. I think it's Ilioma, Ilioma. Ojua, I can't, I can't say I know, her name. Yes, I know who you're talking yes. about. She's a, she's yes. a African American feminist. Yes, and she's amazing. She's an amazing, powerful voice, and I always feel bad about butchering people's names because yeah. my name gets butchered so often. Um, but her and Lindy West are people to look for. Um, who else do I look to that I'm just like I've got happy fuzzies now that I've heard you say that. Oh, um, look for Fatitude, the documentary. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Look for Fatitude. That's amazing. Um, who else do I really love? I, um, I really like Virgie Tover too. Yeah. We love Virgie Tover. She was on our show yeah. last year. Yeah. I'm like, I really like Virgie Tover too. Um, I, I want to say Roxanne Gay, but I'm undecided there. I know that's a real weird thing to say. No. I haven't read. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, I'm undecided. We, yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of that okay. too on both sides and you know, I'm, I'm going to read the book. I haven't read it yet, but that's um, me too. I've got to read the book before I, yeah. So I'm in the middle of it Yeah, and I love it. Yeah. Like, do you? Yes. Okay. I mean, yes, it is powerful. <laughs> it is hard. But, um, when you say like, here, here's why I think you will like her to be honest is okay. because she is unapologetic. Then, yes, I mean, then I think I, need to read it. I think this book that she wrote is we could probably be on the we could extend this podcast probably like another hour and a half <laughs> just, talk, just talking about, about this it. because I oh, think good. okay because what 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 is so powerful about it is that it is an uh, unapologetic letter or or book just about her body and nice. really looking at you know. Again, you want to talk about nuance? I mean, like there is nu – this thing is dripping with nuance and it's really just honest and it's real and it will make you cry and it will make you upset and it will get you thinking. So Good. I I, okay. I think – I like I said, th this is just my experience. I love it. I think it's profound and I think it is – one of those books that um, I would give to almost every client hmm. and have them read. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Cause I'd planned on reading it and I wanted to like, so far so good. Um, but I want to read the book before I'm like, you know, shouting her name from rooftops yeah. Yeah. like a creeper. Like so, I do. So <laughs> here's my recommendation is if you, if you don't like the audio book is her reading it mm -hmm. and um, we are playing it for some of our clients and they love hearing her read it. So, oh, okay. so that might be a good, that might be a to, good way to do it for yeah. me. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So yes, that's, that would be my advice. I guess look for the unapologetic voices out there. Yeah. Awesome. We love those people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on our show. This was an awesome conversation and, um, we are just so excited to have you here to talk about the experience and to celebrate the death of the biggest loser. 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Everybody should have cake. Have cake to celebrate that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Screw you, JD Roth. We're having cake. <laughs> we should actually send him a cake. <laughs> Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks for coming on. And it's been so great to talk to you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for listening. This has been another Dietitians Unplugged production. You can find Aaron at BVMRD.com. And you can find Glennis at DareToNotDiet.com.